With his shaggy hair, laid-back attitude and taste for wild adventure, Sir Richard Branson comes across more like a rock star than a billionaire businessman. Richard's great. You meet a lot of people that are uh, very successful businessmen and they act and behave like successful businessmen and he really acts a lot more like an artist. He's a very creative thinker. No doubt Sir Richard would take that as a compliment. The man who started up Student Magazine at the age of 17 has himself confessed that he initially wanted to be an editor or a journalist and that he only became an entrepreneur in order to keep the magazine going. His early literary leanings seem even more surprising upon learning that he didn't do very well at school on account of his dyslexia. But then setbacks have only ever served as the wind beneath the wings of one of the world's most successful entrepreneurs who was blessed with bundles of energy as a boy. Well, um, Richard was so crazy that I'm amazed he only broke one leg, you know. <laughs> I mean, if you brought, brought up a son like Richard, you would have just as much trouble. Oh. Anyhow, it was great fun. Um, never a dull moment. And he's kept it up ever since. He started up his first two ventures at the age of 15. Sadly, his attempts at growing Christmas trees and raising budgerigars failed to get off the ground. But two years later, he was living in London and running his first successful business, Student Magazine, and had already set up his first charity, the Student Advisory Centre. His famous music empire owed its genesis to selling discounted records from the boot of his car, his company name Virgin arising out of his lack of experience in the business realm. Despite that inexperience, he stacked up enough cash from his record store on London's Oxford Street to buy an estate and launched Virgin Records in 1972 along with its first release. Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells went on to become a number one hit and embarrassed the many other record companies that had turned it down. Virgin also picked up punk pariahs The Sex Pistols and later signed Boy George's Culture Club. Reaching for the skies, he launched Virgin Atlantic Airways in 1984. Using a leased second-hand Boeing 747, it operated its first scheduled service between London's Gatwick Airport and New York's Newark International Airport on June the 22nd, and the airline became profitable in its very first year. Over the next few years, more planes and more routes were added, much to the chagrin of rival airline British Airways. That rivalry tipped over into a full-scale feud when the abolition of London air traffic distribution rules allowed Virgin to start operating from Heathrow Airport in 1991. In 1993, Richard sued BA for using unfair tactics to try and put Virgin out of business. He won the case and was paid half a million pounds in damages. In the year 2000, he sold 49% of Virgin Atlantic for £600 million to Singapore Airlines, just before the airline industry was hit by the devastating aftermath of the September 11 attacks on New York. Richard and his old enemies over at British Airways had to put their heads together to find a way out of the crisis. We spoke about security issues and um, we also spoke about the state of the British aviation industry. Um, and, uh, and obviously on security issues we're uh, working as one with the government and on the state of the British uh, airline industry the government have said that they do not want to see the British aviation industry um, in, in, in any way damaged um, against you know, the foreign carriers, American industry or the European industry and they will do everything they can to help. Holding his nerve, he kept on looking to the future. And in 2002, Virgin Atlantic was the first airline to jump on board the Airbus A340. Virgin Atlantic's taking on the, the, the biggest plane in the world, uh, or the longest plane in the world, um, and buying 10 of them. By the following year, Virgin had upped its passenger intake to 3.8 million, and Richard was being asked for his advice on how to succeed in business. I think the heart in business must, uh, must come first. Um, you must have a passion for something. I mean, for instance, when, we, when I decided to start an airline 19 years ago, Virgin Atlantic, um, 
the heart said that there must be a better way of running an airline than all the airlines I flew on. Um, the service was abysmal um, and I thought I could create something uh, really special. Uh, the head and the accountants were telling me I was off, off my head um, and that I should see, 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 see somebody to examine my head um, because um, um, as somebody once said to me the, the easiest way um, of becoming a millionaire is to um, start off as a billionaire and go into the airline business. It was Richard's determination to ride out the Dirty Tricks campaign mounted by British Airways that forced him to sell his beloved Virgin Records to EMI in 1992. However, he kept his finger on the musical pulse with new label V2 and the retail chain Virgin Megastore. In 2005, he flew in the face of doubts about the future of the music industry by opening the world's 250th Virgin Megastore on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Highland Avenue, right in the heart of Tinseltown. Okay, um, I think you know, a lot of people have felt that music stores are going to be a thing of the past. And uh, what we've, tr we've got a great brand with Virgin. What we try to do is make sure that in 50 years' time we can keep reinventing ourselves and that uh, Virgin Megastores can still survive and fight, thrive throughout the world. Part of that reinvention meant introducing new products to the Megastore shelves, like clothes, books and films. We still like to think we've got the, the best music selection of any store. Um, but we've decided to have some of the, the, the hippest fashion, uh, the best books, the, you know, the, the, the best, um, you know, uh, the, you know the, 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 the best players, um, you know, the, um, the best uh, films, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, we, you know, we've now brought, broadened the range, and I think um, I think it's going to work well. Richard was betting heavily on his understanding of consumers, as well as his talent for covering all bases. The way to compete with downloading uh, is either set up a downloading company yourself, which we have with Virgin Digital, um, or um, you know, create an environment in a store which is actually worth going to. I mean, people do still like to get out of their flats and their houses and, um, and go and have an experience. And I think coming into a Virgin Megastore is an experience. In this instance, however, he backed a losing horse. In 2007, after buying Virgin Group out of the U.S. megastore chain, real estate company Vornado Realty Trust decided to shut down all of its American stores. Meanwhile, in the U.K., a buyout resulted in a complete rebranding before the company finally closed down in 2009. But proving you can't stop the music, the Virgin Group still lends its name to the thriving two-day, two-venue music festival that started up in England back in 1996, with popular rock bands playing one venue on the first day, then swapping over on the second. Richard's son Sam has now become his dad's unofficial ambassador to the V Festival. Then of course there's Virgin Trains, Virgin Cola, Virgin Money, Virgin Vodka and Virgin Comics as well as Virgin Mobile and the more recently launched Virgin Media, which brought together television, internet, mobile phone and fixed line telephone services in the UK through its fiber optic cable network. Although not without some fierce competition from B Sky B owner Rupert Murdoch, who allegedly blocked Virgin Media's bid to gain a stake in ITV. Basically Murdoch is uh, a very good businessman um, he's played a very good card, um, and he um, uh, uh, basically it's up to government to decide whether he can get away with it or not. Um, government's job is to regulate. Um, government's job is to stop too much dominance in the media ending up in, in one person's hand. And I think all of us in this room know that uh, governments are scared stiff of Murdoch. Not so Virgin Media, who can currently lay claim to running the UK's second largest pay TV service, with 3.8 million subscribers. But perhaps one of Sir Richard's most ambitious projects to date is Virgin Galactic, a 
a space tourism company that aims to take paying passengers into space. I met an incredible engineer called Bert Rutan. Uh, he uh, had come, come up with the idea of Spaceship One, and um, Spaceship One did three test flights, proved the technology could work. So Spaceship One is actually above us. This is about three times as big as Spaceship One. And, um, uh, and it's really pushing the boundaries as well, pushing the boundaries uh, literally into space. At the cost of around $200,000 a ticket, passengers will fly suborbitally around the Earth for several hours before returning to Earth. Well, it's, you know, it's a dream uh, that I've had you know, since I was a child, the idea of you know, one day going into space. Um, to actually um, be building five spaceships, I have to pinch myself sometime when I wake up in the morning. Um, and in two and a half years' time, we'll be taking people into space. Um, uh, and we'll be giving people, I think, the experience, the experience of a lifetime. And uh, my ultimate dream is that in time, we'll be able to bring the prices down and down and down so that literally you know, millions of people will have the chance to experience space. His dream received a huge boost in 2009 when a Middle Eastern businessman offered to buy a third of Virgin Galactic for a huge cash injection of $280 million. With cashed up punters already booking advance flights on the Virgin Galactic fleet, it seemed like a safe investment for Mohammed Al Husseini. And I've met people from, uh, I would say, all walks of life men, women, college professors, older people, younger people. Everybody is ready uh, to pay for a ticket uh, to have a chance to go into, into space. That by itself, I think, is quite. Uh... Rumor has it that one of the first passengers to take to space on Virgin will be Star Trek star William Shatner, of whom Sir Richard is a big fan. Keeping his eyes firmly on the future has helped turn Richard Branson into the UK's sixth richest man, with a personal fortune estimated at around £4 billion, with assets that include a 74-acre island in, you guessed it, the Virgin Islands. Aside from Virgin Galactic, one of Richard's greatest passions is Virgin Fuels. Converted from global warming skeptic to eco-warrior after a breakfast meeting with Al Gore, he's now deeply committed to finding a revolutionary cheap eco-friendly means of fueling cars and aircraft. In February 2008, Virgin Atlantic made history by piloting the first ever passenger flight to run partly on biofuel. One of the plane's four engines was connected to a tank containing biofuel derived from barbasu nuts and coconuts. The other three used conventional fuel. We wanted to prove uh, that a biofuel flight could take place, that a plane could fly at 30,000 feet on biofuel. People have always said that would be impossible. That has happened, um, and, uh, and, and it's an historic day. Um, and we believe that, um, that as a result of what's happened today, uh, we can now start developing biofuel, uh, biofuel for the future that hopefully the whole of Virgin Atlantic can use and, and other airlines too. Research was already well underway to find a more sustainable fuel for the aviation industry. Algae would be produced from sewage treatment plants um, uh, and in fact it will have a double whammy effect. We'll be able to take the nasty carbon that comes off sewage treatment plants, we'll be able to turn that into algae uh, and, then, and then use the algae as a fuel for our planes. Although he may have been a little slow on the uptake, Sir Richard has certainly been doing his bit and putting his money where his mouth is to reduce his carbon footprint. He has even put the research and development team over at Virgin Galactic under fuel emissions pressure. That sense of social responsibility helped the big-thinking billionaire come in at number two in a British poll of top role models, beating Jesus into third place. His famous commitment to good causes has earned him close personal friendships with the likes of Nelson Mandela. And whenever he needs a little help launching a new charitable initiative, he can always call on a who's who of A-list celebs. Virgin Unite is Richard Branson's charitable arm of his company. And what they're doing tonight is called Rock the Cosmo. 
and it's to uh, raise money for these indigenous people that live in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco, about an hour outside of Morocco. At the Rock the Casbah benefit in 2007, Richard's mother Eve took the credit for her famous son's generosity. Uh, well, I think with Richard, which is he's crazy as you know, um, I would never allowed him to be um, think about himself. I would, um, and when he was a little boy, if he looked shy, I said, Are you shy? You're thinking of yourself. Don't dare think of yourself. So he was always made to think of outside people. Over the last few years, Sir Richard has made his mum proud by founding and funding the Elders, a group of leaders including Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, Jimmy Carter and Kofi Annan, dedicated to solving difficult global conflicts. He's also set up a school in South Africa to promote the growth and education of budding entrepreneurs from financially disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, empires, empires do not last forever and maybe in 50 or 60 or 70 years time, uh, America will be coming uh, hat in hand to, uh, to South Africa uh, once we've got all these entrepreneurs up there with their successful business. Back home in England, he serves as patron for a charity that raises money for much needed air ambulances and has been known to offer up Virgin Atlantic services to fly medical staff and supplies to crippled war zones. In 2008, at a Virgin Unite benefit to raise funds for organizations who help over one million homeless teenagers in America, celebrities were queuing up to lend their support. Hey, I'll support Richard anytime for all the work that he's doing. Because what he does is incredible. And, you know, I always, it's always great when you get to meet people in this industry or people who have lived fortunate lives who turn that around and actually look outside from themselves and, and try and give something in return and, and especially the way he does it where it really, you know, he causes change and, and I would never not support him in that. Ironically, while his celebrity friends were singing his praises at the Virgin Unite Gala, Sir Richard himself was miles out at sea. Aboard his 99-foot yacht Virgin Money, with his two children Holly and Sam and Olympic hero Ben Ainsley, he was bent on setting a new transatlantic speed record. Via phone link back at the benefit, Charlize Theron proposed a toast. Richard, all of us in this room right now is raising our glasses to you. You're going to make it! Unfortunately, she was overly optimistic. Two days into their journey, gale force winds destroyed the spinnaker and tore a hole in the mainsail, forcing them to abandon their attempt. It wasn't the first time Sir Richard's taste for adventure had landed him in rough seas. Back in 1985, his first go at crossing the Atlantic in record-breaking time saw his Virgin Atlantic Challenger capsize, leading to his rescue by RAF helicopter. Undeterred, he set sail again the following year, aboard the Virgin Atlantic Challenger Mark II. This time, he managed to beat the record by two hours. With the aid of sailing expert Daniel McCarthy and some very favorable winds. Very difficult to describe. Um, seeing the uh, hundreds of Ceylonian boats out there and knowing that uh, the World Cup final was on when we went past, uh, and I have to admit, some of us thought nobody will come out and say hello. But before he'd had time to come down off that high, he was already looking skyward in preparation of his next world record attempt. Over the course of the next few years, his highly publicized hot air balloon exploits saw him become the first person to cross the Atlantic. He also broke the speed record for crossing the Pacific Ocean. Along with fellow businessman and adventurer Steve Fawcett, he then made several unsuccessful attempts to be the first to circumnavigate the globe. When they were beaten to the punch by the Breitling Orbiter 3 in 1999, he switched his focus to the global flyer. It's a magnificent plane that's been built for the sole purpose of uh, trying to fly around the world non-stop on a solo flight. Um, it's a plane that's been built of very light composites. It will um, carry five to six times its weight in fuel. Um, and uh, it's been built here in the Mojave Desert. Um, and we feel that it has the capability of 
going the whole way around the world. With only room in the cockpit for one, however, this time Richard would be staying behind on the ground, as Steve Fawcett took solo piloting honours. Steve went on to endure 76 hours and 45 minutes in the Global Flyer's cramped cabin to establish a new aviation long-distance record of 26,389.3 miles. Meanwhile, Sir Richard found a neat way to combine his entrepreneurial expertise with his daredevil activities in a Fox Network reality TV show billed as a cross between Around the World in 80 Days and Donald Trump's The Apprentice. The rebel billionaire took 16 would-be entrepreneurs around the world and tossed them into challenging situations, like walking a plank between hot air balloons at 10,000 feet. Contestants not brave enough to take on the challenge were left behind on the tarmac, as the rest flew to the next location, in the hope of winning a very special prize. Uh, I'm looking for somebody who would be capable of running a, a group of companies like Virgin. Um, and obviously, you know, we're involved in all sorts of different things, from you know, trains to planes to automobiles to uh, you know, record companies to music stores to um, you know, mobile phones, almost, almost you name it, Virgin's involved with it. So uh, it's got to be somebody who uh, you know, is, 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 will, is good with dealing with people, who can motivate you know, a big team of people, uh, and, um, uh, and you know, somebody who's not um, you know, talking behind people's backs and so, you know, someone who's, who can pull out the best in people. Clearly, he could have been talking about himself. The boy who had been taught to think of others first had learned how to take care of himself at the age of four, when he was dropped off miles from home and told to find his own way back. Since then, he's never shied away from stepping up and doing whatever's in his power to tackle the world's problems. Recognition of his incredible contribution has come in the form of various personal honours. In the year 2000, his services to entrepreneurship were rewarded with a knighthood. In trademark larrikin style, Sir Richard's first thought on becoming a peer was... No more sweaters, sweaters are out. Accompanied by Sam, Holly and his wife Joan, he reflected on the meaning of his new status. Better than being a dead icon, isn't it? <laughs> uh, no, there's a big responsibility goes with that, with that but um, I'm just going to have to live up to it because generally icons at some stage um, mess up and let, and, and, and let people down. And, and, um, um, so I'm going to continue to enjoy life and hope, hope not to put my foot in it too often. And for the most part, he seems to have succeeded. Unlike many of his peers, Sir Richard Branson has so far managed to steer clear of any personal controversy in the press. Still married to Joan after more than 30 years of living together, Britain's richest film and television entrepreneur still looks to be enjoying life. But with a trip to space and more world record-breaking attempts to look forward to, there's still plenty of time for him to mess up yet. Mm -hmm.